from DePaul, from Loyola, and so many friends who are back here tonight for this great event. Um, it's a tremendous privilege and pleasure for me, not just to introduce, but to, for many of us, to reintroduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Maria Clara Lucchetti Bingamer is here right now as a senior research fellow in the Center for World Catholicism and Intercultural Theology, um, doing the project that we're going to hear about in just a few minutes. But she was also here last year, as many of you know, and gave a very successful lecture at the conclusion of her research, and I'll say a word about that in just one second. But it's a great pleasure to have her back and to have so many of the friends of hers here this evening as well. But for those of you who don't know uh, the full CV of Dr. Bingham, I'm not going to read all of it, but she is also an Associate Professor of Theology and Vice Dean of the Center of Theology and Human Sciences in the Pontificia Universidade Católica do Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, she has many, many uh, important positions in the international world of theology. Um, she served on the board of many academic journals, Revista Ecclesiastica Brasileira, Comunio in Lisbon, Rema, Criterio, Cuadernos Adenauer, Alcior, Perspectiva Teológica, Revista Dominicana de Teología, and I think also notably she's on the board of Concilium. She got her doctorate in theology from the Pontifical Uni Gregorian University in Rome, and that's actually worth highlighting, because she was actually the first woman to get a doctorate from that university. Uh, normally known for the bishops and cardinals that come out of it, but in this case, not just that. Um, she's also done uh, postdoctoral work in the Catholic University of Leuven, and basically, to summarize, has uh, inspired many of us around the globe uh, with her work in liberation theology, with theology of women, um, with the question of mysticism, which was the subject of her last big project here at the Paul. She serves on the board of many important councils, like the Fetzer Advisory Council on Humanities, uh, located in Kalamazoo, Michigan. She serves has been a member of Caritas Internationalis Theological Commission. She was a member of the Journal of the Academy, American Academy of Religion and is former director of the Loyola Center for Faith and Culture at the uh, Pontifical Catholic University in Rio de Janeiro. I could go on and on because I'm so excited about uh, the many things I've learned from our speaker this evening, but I just want to mention, in conclusion, her last two publications. In 2011, with uh, uh, Ciudad Nueva, uh, she published Simone Weil, Una Mística en los Límites. Simone Weil, the great French philosopher and mystical thinker, a mystic at the margins. Uh, this is an incredible book. Um, we're hoping, not just in this case, but in all these cases, eventually to see English translations of her work that still uh, lies in the future. But I would highly recommend you know, her essays and her books on Simone Weil, um, e even for our upcoming conference on Eucharist and Social Presence, we took an important quote from Simone Weil about how we are, in fact, bred for the world and things like that. And it's been so groundbreaking, her own research in Simone Weil. And then I'm also very delighted to announce that with the Editoria Rocco in Brazil, uh, she will be publishing in the near future O Misterio e o Mondo Fachao por Deus in Tempos de Descreancia. The, the, the mystery or the world, passion for God in times of unbelief. This is the project that she completed here last year at DePaul and now it's coming out in Portuguese and so we're hoping to in other languages. So without further ado, I'd like you to join me in welcoming our speaker. She'll speak on the witness of Dorothy Day and the future of liberation beyond. Thank you so much. Which microphone? This one? Or this one? This one. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming in this cold evening. <laughs> uh, I'll I love Chicago, even the cold of Chicago, but well, I know that many people suffer with the cold and to come in the evening with the cold is not so evident. So thank you very much for your presence here. Thank you very much to Dr. Casarella and the Center for World Policies for inviting me a second time. 
<coughs> to share a little bit of my researches on Dorothy Day this time. The research I did <coughs> last year about mystics in the 20th century, one of them was Dorothy Day. <coughs> and I found in her life and thought and legacy so much points in common of uh, the Latin American theology, mostly with uh, liberation theology, that it gave me material for another research project that I'm doing right now. And to be able to share it with you, it's a joy. So, um, a practical detail is the first time in my life that I deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jurassic. I always give classes with my throat and my voice and anything else. But, well, everybody told me it's important, it helps. Let's try. Hyra <laughs> is here to help me <laughs> if I'm confused. I'll try to pass the slides without uh, many problems. First of all, I would like to reflect with you a little bit about Dorothy Day being a witness. The witness is something, someone always torn torn in flesh and spirit, torn by the abyss which puts apart the truth for which he or she witnesses from the world that doesn't want to receive his or her message. Therefore, the witness is always conflictive, embarrassing, disturbing, since uh, he, he or she brings to the fore something radical and excessive the mystery that underlies human condition as such, denouncing any attempt to reduce it, strike it, or minimize it. So, truth is connected to the biography of the witness and exposes himself or herself to the boldness of inventing a new language to tell the truth of which humanity has inextinguishable thirst. The witness professes, per se, more than himself or herself. He or she bears a truth that cannot be reduced to mere opinion. And this makes his or her testimony normative, since he or she connects he, his faith, her faith, to the truth with his own des destiny. The witness bears and carries out something precious and urgent and this causes him or her anxiety, stress, anguish. It was this urgence and this call who entered in Dorothy Day's life and made her change radically her life options. In this sense, we would affirm without fear that Dorothy Day is a witness. She gave up everything to respond to this call. Her future, the man she loved, professional opportunities she could or would have. In doing so, she bared witness of the absolute love of God revealed in the face of the poor. Her witness could then inspire many others, her brothers and sisters, on human condition. Dorothy Day always had her sensibility deeply touched by the situation of economical and social injustice she perceived around her. As a 15-year-old girl living in Chicago, in this city, she looked at the world with wide open eyes and an extraordinarily vulnerable heart, reflecting and observing the lives of people living in the oppressed neighborhoods in the south of Chicago, victimized by injustice, poverty, lack of work. She had a vivid sense of who she would be, a kind of premonition of her own vocation which she understood as being inseparable from the life of the preferred by God, the poor. I quote her, from that time on my life was to be linked, my life was to be linked to theirs, to the poor lives. Their interests would be mine. I had received a call, a vocation, and a direction in life. The social sensibility of Dorothy Day has extremely actual features which tell a lot about her conscience level, a lot ahead of time. 
For her, it was not enough to assist the social injustice victims to give alms, to give money, to give, to give old clothes, dusty things she had in the wardrobe. It was necessary for her, besides that, and inseparably, to work to attain and destroy the causes of social disorders. Departing then from those concrete questions, her sensibility feels touched, sharpened, and questioned. And the answer inspired to her is clearly an evangelical answer and not purely intellectual or materialistic one. Where, she says, where are the saints to try to change the social order, not just to minister to slaves, but to do away with slavery? She didn't think this was the job for politicians. Or, no, it's the job of the saints. Where are they? Questions like, injustice and transformation of social structures, which the church has already begun to think since 1891 with Leo XIII encyclical Hero Novarum, but that will only be developed in the 60s by the Council of Vatican II and reshaped by Latin American church with Medellin and Puebla, were always present to door today. In the sense, she has always been a pioneer and why not a prophet. <laughs> For her, it was not enough to fight poverty's effects. Poverty is an evil and has to be excised. For that, society has to be, for that, society has to be transformed by the root. With the knowledge received from God in her prayers and thoughts and thoughts and conversations with others, she, has, she was much ahead the most progressive reflections of her contemporary Catholics. Her reflections and practices present all over her writings, constitute really a systematic thought when taken all together and show her as anticipating movements which would emerge only much later in the church. The conscience of social sin, the need of political and structural solutions instead of simply palliative and fragmented ones, will be very present concretely in liberation theology, the strong theological stream which inspired Latin American Catholic Church during the 70s, but they were already in Dorothy Day in the 20s, the 30s. As you can see, for Dorothy Day, this option for the poor and all her struggle to create together with Peter Morin, the Catholic worker, was not simply a civic or political attitude. It was a spiritual one, fruit of reading honestly and radically the gospel. And that was the spirit she wanted for the Catholic worker, the legacy of her life. In her own words, I quote, what right has any one of us to security when God's poor are suffering? What right have I to sleep in a comfortable bed when so many are sleeping in the shadows of buildings here in this neighborhood of the Catholic worker office? What right have we to food when so many are hungry or to liberty when so many labor organizers are in jail." End of quote. For Dorothy Day, it was not enough then to struggle against poverty from someplace elsewhere, to be an outsider and to analyze it. She believed it was necessary to experience from within the precarity brought by poverty, to feel the effects of poverty because it was the only way that allowed a deeper and truer solidarity with the poor, as it meant to embrace the same faith as them. For her, this real solidarity was essential for Christian commitment. I quote her, we need always to be thinking and writing about poverty, for if we are not among its victims, its reality fades from us. It's very easy to forget, no? We must talk about poverty because people insulated by their own comfort lose sight of it. And maybe no one can be told. Maybe they will have to experience it. End of quote. Jesus' life of solidarity with the poor is the example and the imperative for any Christian discipleship in the world. Dorothy's love for Jesus' person, her Christology, that means her way to conceive Jesus Christ, emphasized the humanity of Jesus, his life of labor as carpenter, as well as the poor and outcasts with whom he chose to associate very closely. 
Jesus' preference for the poor was shared by her, and that was the way she desired to configure the Catholic worker. I quote her once more, we felt a respect for the poor and destitute <coughs> as those nearest to God, as those chosen by Christ for his compassion. Christ lived among humans. The great mystery of the incarnation means that God became human so that humans might become God." End of quote. For some of the researchers on her life and thought, the Catholic worker is considered as a movement which embodies an implicit theology of liberation in the context of North America. This movement of almost 70 years of existence has tried to advocate in the practice of personalism, voluntary poverty, daily works of mercy and nonviolence, and authentic liberation from both personal and social sin, which calls for the conversion of hearts and transformation of structures. The goal of Dorothy Day and Peter Morin, co-founders of the Catholic Worker, was then to create a society in which it will be easier to be good on that, the newspaper, the Catholic Worker newspaper, which was the first, one of the first things they did, had an important role. It intended to reach those most affected by dehumanization and injustice. And in the 30s, when the Catholic Worker began, the most pressing concern where it pointed to was the massive unemployment and terrible poverty caused by the Great Depression. Since then, even the, if the challenges could change on form and content, the movement continued to stand in faithful witness and solidarity with the least and marginalized in society through strikes, labor struggles, protests against wars, prison sentences, always in a nonviolent perspective and praxis. In Dorothy's words, these actions among the poor speaking against war and injustice, were equivalent to giving proof that the gospel could be lived. The Catholic worker wanted to live radical Christian commitment in order to create a new society within the shell of the old. The aims of the Catholic worker are a critique of the unjust distribution of wealth, a critique of the political organization of the government, a critique of the distorted images of the human person caused by class, ra race, and sex. A strong condemnation of the arms race. The means to achieve that are a personalist conception of human being, a decentralized society, nonviolence, the works of mercy, and voluntary poverty. The poor are the center of the Catholic worker concern. They are in all those points, as it has been so in the life and work of the founder, Dorothy Day, who centered on them her spirituality and testimony. In her own words, while our brothers suffer, we must be compassionate with them, suffer with them. How, while our brothers suffer from lack of necessities, we will refuse to enjoy comforts. The concrete daily encounter, often with the poor and oppressed, is the harsh and dreadful love about which Dorothy so frequently spoke about. It's the title of a book on her, The Harsh and Dreadful Love. She was very lucid about the moral fragility and sinful condition of the poor, who are similar to all human beings. She had no illusions about that. She wrote a lot about the bitterness of the poor who cheat each other, who exploit each other even as they are exploited, who despise each other even as they are the despised, who mimetize the oppression. And, and she asks, is it to be expected that virtue and destitution should go together? No. They are the destitute in every day, destitute of this world's goods, destitute of honor, of gratitude, of love. They need so much that we cannot take the works of mercy <coughs> apart and say, I will do this one and that one work of mercy. We find they all go together. Dorothy Day's intuition, then, anticipates in many years the one of liberation theology. When it conceived us, the God of Judeo-Christian revelation as a partial God who prefers the poor, but not because they are morally superior to others. On the contrary, 
exactly because they are poor and therefore more in need than others. Like a lovely and tender father, God comes closer to those who are more in need, the poor, the orphan, the widow, the foreigner. That it's already in the Jewish Bible and it's taken literally by the New Testament. Those who have nobody for them, God supports them, speaks for them, and is their advocate. And so should be those who love God and want to do his will on earth. That is the cradle where was born the Catholic work. That will be the inspiration for liberation theology <coughs> many decades afterwards. For the Catholic worker, in small and concrete gesture, like writing a newspaper and distribute it for a penny a copy, each copy costs a, a penny, or welcoming those in need in a house around hot coffee and shelter. Those actions, like the mustard seed, would grow and have political repercussion, social impact everywhere. That was the belief of Dorothy Day and Peter Moore. Even decades after, in the heart of the Latin American church, the repercussion of all those movements that started before contributed to make Latin American church make her synthesis. Similar to liberation theology, theologians have done many years afterwards, Dorothy Day and Peter Moore did combine a philosophy of right behavior with concrete action, inspired by a theology of incarnated love. It will have lost in common with the theology we will find in Latin America after the Council Vatican II. In 1968, Latin American bishops in Medellin, Colombia, stated that they wanted to be no more a church who reflected orientations and priorities given by the North churches, especially the European ones, but a church source of new thoughts brought from Latin American context, culture. The Vatican II had finished three years before, in 65, and the recepcio of Latin American church for all that unexpected breath of spring, how it's called the Vatican II, represented pointed in, pointed in the direction of the poor. The three major points in Medellin were the first, to connect the preaching of the gospel and the practice of justice. The second, to think the mysteries of revelation from the perspective of the poor. The third, to inaugurate a new way of being church, gathering lay people from the poorest parts of the continent around the Bible to interpret it and connect it to life in a transformative way. In 1979, the Conference of the Bishops in Puebla, Mexico, rescued those three points, assuming them officially within the church. The first gospel and practice of the church justice converted the whole church of the continent to take a preferential option for the poor. The second, to think the mysteries of Revelation from the perspective of the poor, turned to be a new way of doing theology called liberation theology. The third baptized the grassroots groups who gathered around the Bible as basic ecclesial communities. In Aparecida, 2007, the a fifth conference of the Episcopate, uh, Latin American Episcopate, Pope Benedict reconfirmed the option for the poor as an evangelical one, and like that, no more to be discussed uh, about its validity. Uh, I quote the Pope, in this sense, the option for the poor is implicit, already contained in the Christological faith in this God who became poor for us to enrich us with his power. And all that, have this itinerary from Medellin, Puebla, and then Aparecida. According to Gustavo Gutierrez's definition, liberation theology is a critical reflection on praxis. Nevertheless, that could seem a very <laughs> materialistic, philosophical, rationalistic definition, no? Nevertheless, it is the same Gutierrez who affirms that liberation theology doesn't start or depart from a simple critical analysis of reality. It starts from a mystical experience, a deep encounter with the Lord in the face of the poor. 
and builds his system and discourse with a method, a method of three steps to see, to judge, and to act. There is no possible theology in a context unjust and oppressed without a social analysis. That was a big um, shift in liberation theology, in Latin American theology, because the mediation for theological reflection has always been philosophy. Here, the social sciences enter very strongly. Sociology, political sciences, it was very important to dialogue with those sciences to analyze the context. Then, afterwards, confront this analysis with the revelation present in scriptures to judge. From those two moments has to emerge a transformative strategy to act that would inspire and guide the commitments and political positions of the Christians. This theology wasn't meant to remain only on books and academic courses, but had to be given back to the poor to help them to put in act their liberation process. Liberation theology wanted to reinforce the poor struggles on building a new society and struggle together with them so they could become subjects of their own history. Since they stand at the very core of the gospel, then the poor have to be, have been the center of attention of Christian social teaching through 20 centuries of church history, and have been for the church fathers, for the saints and mystics, <coughs> the subject of a privileged form of love. In the middle of the 20th century, this happened, this is reminded again with a new strength when the faithful we are waiting for enlightenment from the mouth of the Pope John XXIII in a climate of rampant secularization. And then John XXIII, at the doors of the Second Vatican Council, defined the church as the church of the poor. The church wants to be the church of everybody, but mostly the church of the poor. Then what comes after is very logical. Since the church wanted to be the church of the poor, all Christians, members of this church, have to make the option for the poor. It is an option that comes from the gospel itself, the tradition of the church, and is reinforced by the magisterium, by the popes. So the option for the poor, or the preferential option for the poor, is one of the basic principles of the Catholic social teaching tradition. It is also present in church canon law, which states, I quote, the Christian faithful are also obliged to promote social justice and mindful of the precept of the Lord to assist the poor from their own resources. In the past decades in Latin America, the phrase option for the poor or the gospel of the poor, everybody thinks that was Gutierrez who employed this the first. No, it was Father Pedro Arrupe, this one, the former general of the Society of Jesus in a letter to the Jesuits of Latin America in 1968. This letter was written in my city, Rio de Janeiro, and it's called Carta de Rio. <clears throat> but as a developed theological principle, the option for the poor was articulated by Father Gustavo Gutierrez in his landmark theological book, A Theology of Liberation. This principle was then assumed by the Catholic bishops of Latin America and put in practice widely. In fact, uh, liberation theology was never a purely academical one, but always wanted to be an ecclesial theology, to serve the church. It was meant to be made within the church in order to help the church to be more coherent with her goal to serve the poor. Liberation theologians were simply trying to go back to the source, to the core of the gospel, which says, blessed are the poor. The gospel advises that the only principle of salvation initiated in Matthew 25 is based not on rituals, commandments, <coughs> professed and orthodox dogmatic truth, but on, on the practice of giving bread to the hungry, water to the thirsty and close to the naked, the famous works of mercy that Dorothy Day uh, liked so much. Liberation theology, in short, follows what Nikolai Berdyaev says, and I quote, if I am hungry, that is a physical problem. If my neighbor is hungry, that is a spiritual problem. 
That discovery led many Latin American Christians to find a new and challenging dimension in the Christian engagement. How not to set apart the liveth faith from the commitment to build justice, and also to search for the roots and causes of poverty and fight them. This means not to seek just an individual conversion, but a collective and structural one. Nevertheless, that conversion implies and includes not only helping the poor with charitable handouts, but also to live like them, to experience, even to a limited extent, what they endure in order to participate in and empathize with their suffering and their condition. Then from within, be able to help the poor to become artisans of their own history. As Gustavo Gutierrez says in his book, I quote again, when it is lived in authentic imitation of Christ, the witness of poverty does not alienate us from the world at all. Only through concrete acts of love and solidarity can we effectively realize our encounter with the poor and the exploited, and through them with Jesus Christ. To give to them is to say yes to Christ. To refuse them is to reject Christ. So the spirituality of living to some extent the life of the poor became an intrinsic part of liberation theology. To be close to the poor includes experiencing at first hand their condition of poverty and injustice. It is also Gustavo Gutierrez who tells us, I quote, Christian poverty has meaning only as a commitment of solidarity with the poor, with those who suffer misery and injustice. It's not a question of idealizing poverty, but rather of taking it on as it is, an evil, to protest against it and to struggle to abolish it. Because of this solidarity, which manifests itself in specific action, the style of life, and the break with one's social class, one can also help the poor and exploit it to become aware of their exploitation and seek liberation from it. This challenge found a profound response among many <coughs> Christians of the continent, including the church hierarchy. In, um, during the Vatican II, there were a, a numerous group of bishops, Latin American bishops, who uh, wrote and signed a pact. It's called Pacto das Catacumbas, Pacto de las Catacumbas, because it was signed in the Catacomb of Domitila in Rome. Uh, in this pact, they committed themselves to simplify their lifestyle and not to use um, commodities and uh, com uh, facilities that the poor didn't have. It's a very beautiful text. should be more highlighted. So, including the church hierarchy. In Latin America, the general conference of the bishops post-Vatican II dealt with this issue and with the choices it implied and with possible ways to put it into practice in order to build the kingdom of God. Uh, in the basic communities, there were a kind of lab of all those things that were happening. Uh, they were as a fruit of the option for the poor. Liberation theology, despite doctrinal codification by Gutierrez, Boff, and others, strove always to be a bottom-up movement in practice, with biblical interpretation and liturgical practice designed by lay practitioners from the grassroots themselves, rather than by church hierarchy. This is rather the practical translation of the biblical principle that faith operates by charity. And as the letter of James states, in the same way, faith, if good deeds do not go with it, is quite dead. The challenge was so to be more and more simple, leaving evangelical poverty while at the same time struggling against sinful structures that produce poverty. Many questions arose from that need felt by Latin American church to change its lifestyle to be closer to the poor. Many groups were formed who tried different models of following Christ by following the poor. Also, many other groups, middle class Catholic ones, rejected the idea of becoming poor as the only way to leave their faith. That was when Claude of Isboff, one of the most prominent liberation theologians, came up with a typology that greatly helped understanding of what it meant to share the life of the poor and make the preferential but not exclusive option for the poor while respecting one's state of life, work, and familiar commitments. Claude of Isboff says that every Christian has to commit to the option for the poor because this is the only way truly to follow Jesus Christ. The fathers of the church, as Irenaeus, Chrysostom, Ambrose, also 
affirm that. But life circumstances, uh, however, can be and are very different and diverse. That is why the mandate, unavoidable for every Christian, can have various nuances when put into practice. That is so more than one way to opt for the poor. So Clodovis presents three models. It's very interesting. In his book, he wrote with George Pixley, um, Option for the Poor. The first, one can opt for the poor with a conversion of interests. A person can, on one hand, have a work, hold a position amongst their peers and the public. On the other hand, this work is not to seek only money, success, prestige, luxury, but uh, direct skills, capabilities, and fruits towards the needs of the poor to help and empower them. Also try to ensure the social impact of the actions done, making structures more just and society more fair. The second one, one can also opt for the poor by alternating one's social place with theirs. That is the case of many Christians, both religious and lay people, who work or study during the week and during the weekend help out in a poor neighborhood. There are those who teach at the university and during holidays live amongst the poorest people, giving classes, building houses, providing free medical consultations, or dentistry. To some extent, they share in the living conditions of those who are poor, if only for a certain number of hours, days, or weeks. Clodovis himself did that. He was a professor in the Puc Rio, and in the, during the big holidays, summer holidays, he went to the Acre, extreme north of the country, a very poor zone, where his congregation had a mission, and spent those three months there. The third way of living the option for the poor is the incarnation. This means to burn bridges, to cut ties with previous life, comfort, privacy, time and money, and go to share entirely in the life of the poor. There have been many lay monks or clergy who have done this, and many who continue to do it. This was the option of the art today. And this has strong consequence. It's always Gustavo Gutierrez who writes with strength and prophetical fire. Love of neighbor is an essential component of Christian life. But as long as I apply that term only to the people who cross my path and come asking me for help, my world will remain pretty much the same. <coughs> Individual almsgiving and social reformism is a type of love that never leaves its own front porch. But the existence of the poor is not neutral on the political level, or innocent of ethical implications. <coughs> Poor people are byproducts of the system under which we live and for which we are responsible. That is why the poverty of the poor is not a summons to alleviate their plight with acts of generosity, but rather a compelling obligation to fashion an entirely different social order. Those who made this incarnation option uh, provoked a lot of movement in the society. It is this entirely different social order that many Latin American Christians meant to build. It is also the one that Dorothy Day and Peter Moran, with the Catholic worker, intended to, to build a new world in the shell of the old one. In a, in a certain sense, uh, of the option for the poor is called, this is the words of John Sabrina, a political holiness. Holiness doesn't have only an individual dimension, perfection, etc. That's very important. But uh, with liberation theology and this way of thinking, the whole movement towards the margins, uh, holiness is a political issue too, because it has political impact. <coughs> now uh, I presented a little bit both sides. I would like to present some similarities and some differences. On one side, Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker, <coughs> on the other side, liberation theology. Um, the first and most important similarity is the poor at the center of the Christian commitment. Both movements don't separate faith and life, faith and practice, spirituality and action. It is either for Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker, either for liberation theology, to proclaim the creed and not let the needs of the poor fail to challenge and question oneself. 
The second is uh, the radical form that this option for the poor has to take. Both are agree, the Catholic work <coughs> today and liberation theology. It's not simply um, to give the excess and having some well-known poor to whom one gives what exceeds our capacity of consuming or filing, you know, what's uh, filling up our wardrobes. Both have very clear in mind and heart that the whole life should be transformed by the encounter with the poor. While Dorothy Day shaped all her life and action according to the needs of the poor, building houses of hospitality to shelter them, feeding them when they were hungry, and assuming the striping and deprivation which were consequences of that in her own life, she used only donated clothes. She never bought the clothes. And, and she was proud when someone confused her with some of the, <laughs> the, the women who were helped by the shelter. She was very proud of that. <laughs> but they thought she was a homeless. So. Um, till the end of her life, she died among the poor. She, I completely identified with them. Liberation theologians formulated their reflections always around this need, this need of a structural transformation and not only a momentaneous assistance to someone's needs. So the political element is very clear for both. The third, uh, for one side and the other, it's clear that it's not an individualistic option. On the contrary, it has to do necessarily with the building of a community. That is how the Catholic worker houses became communities of solidarity, where the sharing of life and goods were constitutive of their identity. That is how liberation theology had as concrete fruit the basic ecclesial communities. The novelty of the gospel can't let things how they are. It is necessarily transformative, and the mediation for that is the community. Four. The implications of the option for the poor have much in common in both movements. And the main one is that it is impossible to make this option from a distance. It's necessary to make the movement that God himself did in his canonic descent towards human flesh. The option for the poor is, a zinc, is an incarnate option and suppose an exodus from oneself's habits, comforts, possessions, time, for Dorothy Day, this was very clear, and she left this as a heritage for the Catholic worker. For liberation theology, it was also clear, up to the point that Claude Visboff had to elaborate those three possible levels to do this option for the poor. If, even if one doesn't arrive to the third, the incarnational one, at least the first conversion of interest is mandatory. Both uh, Dorothy Day, Catholic worker, and liberation theology, when putting the service to the poor at the center of their lives and action, weren't making a sociological or political choice only or mainly. They were making a theological choice, backed up by the whole thought, teaching, and history of the church hold of more than 2,000 years. They affirm once and more that it is necessary to opt preferentially for the poor because God did so. God revealed himself as the God of the poor, the one who comes down because of hearing the cries of the people in distress, the one who speaks for the poor, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, the one who leaves his or her divine privilege and comes to take human vulnerable and mortal flesh, being obedient till the death of the cross. The first motivation to opt for the poor is not to create a political party or concrete political structures. It is to do God's will and build his kingdom. The changing of structures and transformation of reality is a consequence of that. Together with those similarities, there are also certain strong and important divergences, differences between one and the other movement. The first, while Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker give great importance to the conversion of the heart and want this to be a central point of the revolution, or today speaks a lot of times about the revolution of the heart, liberation theology believes it is imperative to make a structural revolution. It's not enough, a conversion of the heart. It must be a structural revolution, which attains the roots of injustice and oppression and change social and political order. That doesn't mean that Dorothy Day and the Catholic work didn't give importance to social and political transformations, on the contrary. 
But their priority was to change the person. They were personalists, <coughs> disciples of Emmanuel Mounier. Change the person, and then this person changed would change the society. It doesn't also mean that liberation theology didn't pay attention to people, to each person with his or her infinite value. But its goal, its major goal, was to transform deeply and radically the society and the political configuration of it. That is why some of the critical points of liberation theology more than once identified themselves with some political systems. Many liberation theologians wrote um, praising and, uh, and <clears throat> identifying themselves with Nicaragua, the Nicaragua Sandinista, Cuba, China. <clears throat> Those systems failed afterwards. And uh, it was then a clear demonstration that there is, there is no political system that can fulfill what's the utopia of the kingdom of God. Um, this uh, generated a lot of problems of liberation theology with the Vatican, because um, the Vatican thought that, that they, as theologians, they were not allowed to uh, make any fit within the big utopia of the kingdom of God. So liberation theology was very much criticized by that, and certainly that was at the root of the difficulties it had with the Vatican. The second difference, while both of them were a critical instance within the church, their critique had different shapes. While Dorothy Day had a major concern on being faithful and obedient to the institutional church, having many times withdrawn publicly her positions to obey orientations of her superiors without ever losing her freedom, liberation theology had many direct and public confrontations with the Catholic Church as its institution and official levels. Many theologians were punished and left priesthood and even theology. Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker have always been very keen on being Catholic and didn't want to enter in conflict with the church. Sometimes they did. It's famous, the, the, the exchange of sharp words between Dorothy Day and Cardinal Spellman about the strike of the great diggers uh, the cardinal sent seminarians to make the work of the strikers, and Dorothy supported the strikers, but she never entered in open and direct and violent conflict with the authority. Uh, liberation theology, as every theory which deals with concepts, had a very hard time on the side of the church because of the use of Marxist categories of analysis. The liberation theologians argued that this was the same that during the Middle Ages Thomas Aquinas, using the pagan philosophy of Aristotle, did. And it's, it's right, it's certain. But anyway, this was a very critical point which has never been well resolved, I think, from the side of liberation theology. <clears throat> the third. Liberation theology had the intention of building a new way of doing theology. It was really a church proposal, but an academical one, even if it was meant to happen within the church and put at the service of the poor. The more prominent theologians studied for years outside the continent, in Europe, in the States, obtained degrees and wrote books and articles developing their theory. There was a whole collection rethinking all theology topics from the perspective of the poor. I, I took part in two volumes. Many are translated in English. It was meant to have 50 volumes, but it stopped at the 20th because of Rome's intervention. Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker had never the intention to elaborate a theological system. That doesn't mean that there was not a deep and good theology behind their praxis. Also, many books and articles have been written by and about Dorothy Day thought and about the Catholic worker movement. But it was never a priority to them to think systematically and rigorously about their praxis. The priority was praxis, not theory. Liberation theology, what's its future? And what has Dorothy Day to have to, to say a word on this future? Liberation theology spread widely during the 70s and 80s. After 89, like many other things, with all the changes the world was going through, the crisis 
uh, came for liberation theology. The fall of Berlin Wall and of real socialism affected many lay people who were deeply committed to a social and political struggle as a consequence of the Christian faith. The Vatican had many difficulties with liberation theology and many theologians came under suspicion or were even punished because of their ideas which are considered communist and atheistic. Outside the church, it looked like the socialist utopia was definitely defeated and the only possible model of society was the capitalist one. Without the balance of power provided by the socialist bloc, the second world, there was no means of thinking about a way of living other than through the market economy and consumerist society. A great sense of disillusionment stole into the hearts and minds of many of those who had been so supportive of the proposals of liberation theology and who had learned to read and interpret the gospel through that model. Now with historical distance, we can evaluate this crisis as a positive one, I think. It forced liberation theologians to expand and enlarge their horizons and to realize that the process of liberation is not only about, first of all, not only about human beings, but the whole of creation. Ecological concerns and the struggle to protect the earth came to be seen as indivisible, indivisible from human concerns. And that was a very positive thing. Environmental sustainability and care for the earth came onto the liberation agenda alongside with other issues just such as gender, race, ethnicity, etc. The reflection began with the conviction that to build justice also implied building a sustainable world. Everything that harmed human beings was harmful to the planet as well. If the human race continued to destroy nature and life in all its manifestations, very soon, very soon, human beings would no longer be able to survive. The inseparable link between the struggle for justice and the struggle for nature and biodiversity became central to committed theological issues. Christian theology, even if it's, it's a more open and up-to-date form such as liberation theology, was accused of having too anthropocentric an approach to the world and human life in it. The traditional interpretation of the Genesis mandate to grow and dominate the earth was considered responsible for humankind's greedy attitudes towards nature and creation. To reverse this idea, theology has had to evolve. Christian consciousness grew increasingly aware that to respect and to reverence the earth in all the forms in which it presented itself to the five human senses was the sine qua non for achieving a process of liberation according to the tenets of the Bible and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Also, I mentioned already, gender, the issues of gender, race, and ethnicity began to be at the center of the concerns of liberation theology, together with religious pluralism and the interreligious dialogue. At the end, everything that makes obstacle to human beings' liberation interests theology. Those are the topics that liberation theologians, the second and even the third generation, are working on today. The big question of the poor is always there because, unfortunately, poverty is far from being overcome. But liberation theology doesn't deal with them only from the social, economical, political point of view, recognizing that there are other anthropological poverties afflicting human beings. So in this moment of looking from far away, is the title of an important recent book of Gustavo Gutierrez, Mirar Lejos, to look from far away. <laughs> Dorothy Day's witness can bring some powerful issues to contribute for liberation theology to a more rich, more deep, and more theological future. The first, I think, is the issue of nonviolence. Dorothy Day was a faithful, constant, and respectful peace builder. More than once, a Christian connected to more than one Christian connected to liberation theology has involved himself or herself with violent issues, took weapons. Dorothy Day never, never surrendered to this temptation. Nowadays, when almost all Latin American countries are seeing the sad spectacle of their youth being killed by violence, fruit of drug addiction, narcotraffic, gangs, and authorities' reaction in many times responding with more violence, the stubborn faithfulness of Dorothy Day to the Gospel of Jesus, the Sermon of the Mount, can be very important 
for theology being able to think all these sad situations. The only position about that is radical, about violence, is radical and without compromise, sticking to forgiveness and reconciliation as the only possible answers. The second contribution is the centrality of spirituality. Dorothy Day was a doer, a woman of action, but she was also a contemplative. And because of that, her action was so blessed, so coherent, so fruitful. When the temptation comes to search for purely secular solutions, the witness of Dorothy Day remembers that the only source of true liberation is God, and anything to be done has to find its roots in Him and nowhere else. The third, a creative faithfulness to the church. Dorothy Day was a free woman, but she was a fervent and faithful Catholic too. The last thing she would like would, to be quar would, to qu to, would be to quarrel with the church. Because of that, she lived difficult moments when her conscience was argued and confronted with the hierarchy's directions. She stood up faithful, humble, but free. I think we can see in her the incarnation of a rule of St. Ignatius on the spiritual exercise about feeling with the church. I will read the rule because it works. it's worth reading. To keep ourselves right in all things, we ought to hold fast to this principle. What I see as white, I will believe to be black, if the hierarchical church thus determines it. For we believe that between Christ our Lord, the bridegroom, and the church, his spouse, there is the one same spirit who governs and guides us for the salvation of our souls. For it is by the same spirit and Lord of ours who give the Ten Commandments that our Holy Mother Church is guided and governed. St. Ignatius was far from being an idiot. <laughs> he was four times in the hands of the Inquisition. He knew very well about what he was speaking. What he wants to say here is that the truth will appear. But if we introduce a rupture, a disrupture in the process, perhaps the truth will take more time to appear. So to be faithful, not to see the black and white, but to believe. Oh, I believe. You say I believe, let's see. <laughs> if the black is white, or if the white is black, the future will say. I think Dar today is a beautiful example of this creative faithfulness, never losing her freedom, never making concessions in what is not negotiable, but faithful to what she was. I will read the, at the end a note that will be, a, I think, a beautiful example of that. Dar today was always very close to Latin America, too. She had a special love for this continent, neighbor, to hers, the same continent, and had many contacts that were very important for her life. One of the most important was with the peasant leader Cesar Chavez, Mexican-American apostle of nonviolence and founder of the National Farm Workers Association. This man who believed in fast and nonviolent means to do justice was Dorothy's companion in many struggles. She also, at the beginning of her Catholic conversion, had contacts and interviewed General Augusto Cesar Sandino, the head of the Nicaraguan rebels. She tells us, and it's very flavoring, this passage, she was working for the Anti-Imperialist <coughs> League. And so she says, the work we are engaged in was to publicize and raise funds for General Sandino, who was resisting American aggression in Nicaragua. Our Marines were hunting him in the mountains, and the work of our committee was to raise funds and medical supplies to support him. I did the publicity. I was so new a Catholic that I was still working for this committee for some months after my baptism, and I talked to Father Zachary, her professor, about the work. I am in agreement with it, I told him. We should not be sending our Marines to Nicaragua. I am in agreement with many of the social aims of communism from each according to his ability and to each according to his need." <coughs> End of quotation. Father Zachary was very patient, explained to her about atheism, which is in the base of Marxism, and gave her the life of Saint Teresa of Lisieux to read. It became her favorite saint afterwards. Uh, she also wrote a preface that, that was, is to show how much in contact with the libertarian 
ideas and practices in Latin America she had. She also wrote the preface to a book on Camilo Torres. Camilo Torres was a Colombian priest uh, who entered the guerrilla and uh, took arms and, uh, <coughs> together with the students. He was a professor, in fact, he taught at the university. Uh, he was killed uh, in the guerrilla, struggling in the guerrilla. Uh, so there is a book on Camilo Torres. They asked the Dorothy to write the preface. She wrote a long preface, 30 pages. It's a wonderful piece, well written, full of truth, together with ability. In it, we feel Dorothy Day agrees with Camilo Torres' ideals and struggles, but doesn't agree with the violent ways he chose to obtain what he believed it was the truth. That is why she delicately, at the second part of the preface, confronts Camilo Torres with another apostle, a Protestant one this time, Martin Luther King Jr. She describes longly how this one, Martin Luther King, had the same dreams and ideals as Camilo Torres, but chose the way of nonviolence and was killed without ever killing anyone. At the end, she says, I quote, Martin Luther King Jr., we ask your prayers that we learn more to overcome ourselves and to learn the violence we need to impose upon ourselves in overcoming righteous wrath against the oppressor and so grow in nonviolence. Father Camilo Torres, pray for us that we may have your courage in offering our lives for our brothers. And may God's light shine upon you both and may you rest in peace. But the most impressive and rich of her testimony among Latin American leaders is the little note handwritten she sent to Fidel Castro, Cuban Prime Minister, in 62. She went to visit Cuba, she stayed there for a while, and before leaving, she writes, this note, uh, the note was supposed to be a telegram, but we have access in the Marquette archives only to the handwriting. Prime Minister Fidel Castro, Fidel Compañero, I have visited your country, broken bread with the peoples, visited in the granjas with pescadores, with travelers, citizens and soldiers on the autobus to San Diego de Cuba, with the students and teachers and soldiers at the school, city of Camilo Cienfuegos, that beautiful gift of the army to the children of the Sierra Maestra. I love Cuba and the work of the revolution. Before I leave next Monday, October 1st, for Mexico and the US, I beg a tremendous favor. As a Catholic, I beg to visit the, visit the imprisoned priests to report on their welfare. Can they offer mass? Are they being taught to work with their hands? Are they living in solitary or with others? As a Catholic utopian socialist, I greet the revolution. As a Catholic communicant, may I greet the imprisoned priests whose office I must respect, though I disagree with their politics. Permit me this work of mercy, I beg you. I pray for you and the revolution daily. With profound respect, Compañera Dorothy Day. As far as we know, Fidel never answered. <laughs> as we can see, the witness of Dorothy Day can be of great impact, not only to liberation theology, but for every Christian who today wants to live his or her faith connected with concrete life problems and open to intercultural and interfaith dialogue. She can teach us the difficult art to be faithful to our identity while open to the difference of the other, to be radically coherent in what we believe, to be the sake of the kingdom and the glory of God, and to be respectful for other ways of feeling and thinking about the same thing. And last but not least, never to get distance distant from what is the heart of the good news, because it is the heart of God himself, the privilege of the poor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's a lot to think about. This is an amazing lecture, and especially I want to Tell the students there's a lot to think about and write about, but also in terms of day-to-day -day life and 
spirituality, but uh, would you be willing to entertain a few questions? We have a little bit of time. Of course. So the floor is open. Fascinating talk, thank you. Um, early on in your talk, you talked about how Dorothy Day's ideas uh, anticipated the thinking of liberation theology by several decades. To what extent have liberation theologians acknowledged the link? Or are you simply identifying something that has been running on parallel lines up to now? Astonishingly, incredibly, the majority don't even know about Dorothy Day. No, some mention here and there, but she's very unknown in Latin America. It is my wish to, at least to, to have the, the principal words translated to Spanish, because there is not. <coughs> there is a very old translation of The Long Loneliness in Spanish from South Africa. In Portuguese, there is nothing. So, but um, I think that, um, that people like her, Smartile also, mm, they are so genius, so uh, deep. They anticipate intuitions you know, that the, the collective will, it will arrive to only afterwards. It's a little bit the role of the, of the prophet. I think she was a prophet. But uh, I think it would, have great, it would be a great help if she would be more well known in Latin America because she's not. Oh, I'm interested in that other piece of work. We, that you're Sister doing. Francis, we ask you to use the microphone, please. Okay. So we'll get <coughs> I'm interested in that other piece of work that you're doing on mysticism. And my question to you is, do you think that Dorothy Dade was an incarnational mystic? I think she was a mystic, because I understand the mystic according to the definition, for instance, of Bernard McGinn, as someone who has uh, the awareness of the presence of God and lives this union of God consciously, and that affects his or her life. According to this definition, I wouldn't hesitate to call her today a mystic. And you ask me if I think she is an incarnational mystic. Yes. Uh, she, um, the center of her, her mystic is the mystery of incarnation. Hmm? The canon is of God, who incarnates, who takes flesh. I think that, yes, she is a, a powerful incarnational mystic. Perhaps there is the, her affinity with the husband is you more than other things, the, the little way, also that. But I think the, the passion for the, the mystery of incarnation is common to both of them. Um, I, I didn't know that Dorothy Day lived in Chicago. Um, <laughs> Was she uh, influenced by Jane Addams? As far as I, my, my research goes, it, it was not a major influence. I know some works that compare both of them. Hmm? But, uh, well, she was very much, she read a lot when she was a teenager. So she was much influenced by her readings, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, um, some French authors, Germanos, uh, Moriac, and also uh, well, Dickens, Victor Hugo, and the uh, North American author, Upton Sinclair, who wrote this famous novel, The Jungle. This novel influenced her very strongly. She uh, walked, took long walks in the neighborhoods of South Chicago, thinking of the Upton Sinclair's novel, situating it, and um, there are many studies on that. Nature uh, taught her her option for the poor, mm -hmm. the, because all those authors deal with this question, Dostoevsky, also the non-institutional Christianism of Tolstoy, and that this was very important for her. 
the Jane Addams, well, I saw already comparisons, but I don't think it was a major influence on her. This may be outside the scope of your work, but what strikes me in your presentation is that, that there's this uh, practical piece, you know, not just the, the mystical, not just the contemplation, but the action. And that there's a, com there's a parallel between the community that Dorothy Day wanted to create and that liberation theology created in the base Christian community. And so in terms of the future of liberation theology and that move, do you see, where is that going? You know, it, the basic community. Well, the whole yeah, the whole idea that we we need to create a different kind of social mm -hmm. and what can the liberation community or theology. <coughs> well, um, in the eighties, the liber the basic communities were growing and spreading a lot in Latin America. Only in Brazil has more than eighty thousand. Um, then began a theological discussion, a canonical discussion. Are they? A, basic ecclesial communities, or are they only basic communities? Because the ecclesi are they forming a parallel church, the popular church, or blah, 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 blah. Uh, There was a <coughs> continental meeting in, sorry, in João Pessoa, in Paraíba, in the northeast of Brazil, and everybody was anguished and stressed to see what would happen, because everybody was saying that the bishops weren't going, because they wouldn't participate in the parallel church meeting. It was full of bishops. Mm -hmm. And the people of the communities were happy to be with the bishops. So it was clear it was not a parallel church. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be with their bishops, with the pastors. But Brazil is a continent. But Brazil has little clergy for the, the, the biggest Catholic country in the world has no clergy. 70-80% of the Brazilian Catholics on Sundays don't have Eucharist. Not because they don't want, because they can't. There's no priest. So they have celebrations, reading of the Bible, etc. <coughs> that was the beginning of the basic community. With the Bible, lay people reading the Bible, uh, <laughs> sharing. The, the biblical circles was the beginning. And then they became real communities. They had liturgies. Uh, directed by lay people. So, um, for uh, Lula, <laughs> our former president, was a member of a basic community in the periphery of Sao Paulo. Um, uh, mostly in some places, Sao Paulo was one of them, the, the basic communities had many leaderships who went out to, the, to, be, uh, to enter the political the political parties and to candidate to a senate and deputies, etc. Most many of them were elected. In '89, when Berlin Wall falls and when Lula loses the election, there was a big, big crisis, and that was a very strong um, golf, golf strike uh, uh, on the basic communities. Um, uh, they didn't disappear, but there was a big crisis of the militantes, how we, we call it, the, the leaders who acted there. Mm -hmm. So um, today, uh, I think the, with the document of Aparecida, it's clear that the bishops consider the basic communities. For instance, I heard Don Erwin Kreutler, the bishop from Imperatriz, Pará. Não, mas qual é o nome da Diocese? Imperatriz, eu acho. Imperatriz. In the north of the country. He's Austrian and he lives in Brazil. A wonderful person. And he says, in my region, the only thing to work pastorally is the basic communities. I have no other instrument. Because it's a huge extension, very few people. So the, the the, the religious, the, the nuns, and the, the lay people, they form basic communities, and that, that's how the church goes. Hmm? In other regions, perhaps not. So the document of Aparecida put all together new communities. 
and in the under the style of put the basic communities and the communities of the new movements. Um, there are some strong in Brazil, the Popolari are very strong, uh, Comunia Liberazione is not so strong as the Popolari, but he is there, and uh, well, there are many, the charismatic uh, movement. So um, they consider it's important to have communities of lay people, but they don't consider the basic communities as a different one. It's part of the others. Hmm? I agree and not agree at the same time. I agree, well, it's community of lay people in that, yes. But it's so different, the profile, the model. It's difficult to put all together. No? It's, uh, it's mostly of poor people, while those other are more of middle class. Um, so I think it didn't disappear, it still exists, it's strong. But it's not the same force that we could see in the 80s. I think Roy had a question. No, no, it's pretty, much, it's pretty much the same thing. I was just wondering if there are now people who are leaders, people who are spokespeople, who can keep the uh, sense of liberation <coughs> theology alive and not crumble under the, uh, uh, the, the hierarchy of the church. Well, the truth is the great stars are dying, of course. Mont Blanc is dead, Leonardo Boff, He's no more a theologian. He is a theologian, but he uh, works more with philosophy, but he's 70 right now. It's normal. People get old, <laughs> you know? They are, there is a new generation. There is a new generation. But the new generation has a slightly different profile. They are more, um, okay, they are very much committed with interreligious dialogue, for instance, very much. Because the, the face of, re, of religion in Brazil changed a lot. Mm -hmm. The Protestantism, the Pentecostal Protestant church, growed and growed and growed as mushrooms. Yeah. Uh, and the, they, there is even a, a funny thing that is said a little bit with sadness, but with irony. Uh, the church made an option for the poor, and the poor made an option for the Pentecostal. <laughs> <laughs> there are many, 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 because it's very easy to form a Pentecostal church. Four people, you have a pastor, and, and they're in the church. No? So, um, but there are some uh, strong leaders, for instance, we in, the, in our course, uh, the course of theology in uh, the book Rio, the major part of our students are lay people, are not seminarians, not religious, are lay people. So there is a lot of interest from part of the lay people in theology. So uh, I, I think they are making a different synthesis, but they are carrying the strongest achievements of liberation theology together. It's, I think this is important. One more question, Chandri? Uh, yeah, yeah, the Chandra. microphone. Uh, John also doesn't get confused with Lula. Hmm? John also he doesn't get confused with Lula. <laughs> That's not Lula, it's Fidel Castro. <laughs> I don't know how to turn around. <laughs> You said that liberation theology has uh, similar concepts with uh, communism and socialism. So, um, uh, you know, like uh, with egalitarianism and uh, the work of communal action in order to change uh, structures. Uh, in uh, the early 1960s, uh, João Goulart, uh, the president of Brazil, he was considered a, a socialist, kind of. You know, jungle. jungle, yeah. <laughs> so, um, do you, do you think that the coup of 1964 uh, might have occurred with the help of like liberation theology? Do you think the liberation theology might have been a catalyst for the Brazilian military uh, having uh, a being, uh, performed, uh, uh, I'm sorry, for, for performing that coup uh, in order to prevent the rise of, of, of the poor towards socialism? No, on, on the contrary, I think the, <laughs> it, the, it didn't exist, liberation theology, at that time. 
but that was a very strong movement, lay movement, Ação Católica, Action Catholique, uh, came from France. Many of the, uh, the Catholic intellectuals then were committed in this movement who were very open socially. There was a leader, uh, a Jesuit, who was a little bit the mentor of this movement of Action Catholica, the father Enrique de Lima Vaz, brilliant philosopher, <laughs> very, very bright, who uh, redacted, wrote the, all the texts of the movement. But when the, the military coup approached, many of the the, the youngsters who were in the Acción Católica went to the um, uh, API, Acción Popular, who was different. That was guerrilla with uh, arms and the weapons, and hmm, Father Vaz was very, very sad with that. Many of those were in prison, tortured, etc. So what I believe is that um, <coughs> what happened after and resulted in liberation of the old, was a reaction to this uh, revolution in <laughs> between brackets that happened in 64. And it was a very conservative revolution uh, by the military. Many similar happened in other countries of the continent, in Argentina, Chile, worse than ours, worse in numbers of deaths. Uh, but, um, I think that it was uh, really um, something to take the power because President João Goulart was legally the president, like Allende. So to take him out of the power, it was really illegally. <laughs> That's why only the generals could do that, like in Chile, like in, in Brazil, like in, in Argentina. It was done, and Brazil lived the, the anos de chumbo, how do you call it, the, 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 plump, plump? the plump years, yeah? where many students were put in prison, tortured, dead, etc. Among them, Frei Beto, one of the most prominent liberation theologians, the Dominican friar, was put in prison with his whole community. One of them died, the other left the Dominican order, Frei Beto is a Dominican up to today. Well, thank you. Before we break, I'd just like to make two quick announcements. Uh, Maria Claude has been very faithful, not only in her brilliant scholarship, but also as a very generous collaborator. And one of the fruits of that collaboration has been that we actually now have a formal agreement between her university and Rio de Janeiro and Nepal. And as a result of that, we, um, we had a meeting in, in uh, Colombia and Bogota. And on March 15th and 16th, there's going to be a virtual conference connecting Nepal the Universidad Javeriana in Bogota and the Pontificia University of Rio de Janeiro. And on the 15th, we'll have in the Loop campus, if you're interested, let me know and I'll get you the exact information. On the 15th in the afternoon, we'll have in the Loop campus um, a presentation in English and Spanish of this conference on forgiveness. Um, some of the presentations will be in, in Spanish. But I also wanted to bring to your attention, and we have flyers about this in the back, that uh, those of you who have gotten your first taste of Maria Clara this evening can come back and see her again. Uh, starting April 16th, uh, we will kick off World Catholicism Week 2012. My colleague William Cavanaugh will give a, a lecture on the, the topic of our academic conference, Real Presences, Eucharist Society, and Global Catholicism, that's the evening of April 16th. And the respondents will be Maria Clara Lucchetti Bingamer, um, Father Emmanuel Catongole, a theologian at Duke Divinity School and Francis Cardinal George. Um, we also have, during that week, uh, from the 17th to 19th, and culminating on Thursday the 19th, um, the conference for uh, students, Time for God, Working Catholic Spirituality, and to my schedule, and the highlight of that will be a filming of a TV show for the Canadian Catholic uh, TV network, Salt and Light. Uh, it, the show is called In Your Faith. In your <laughs> Father Tom Morsica, the CEO of Salt Lake, will give a lecture on the evening of the 19th. And then April 20th, the, the last part of World Catholic the Week will be Solidarity Across the Borders, Catholic Education in America Today. And we'll have presentations by Father Dennis Holstein, the president of DePaul, and uh, Jose Morales Orozco, <coughs> the president of the uh, Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. So I invite you all to that. Please join me in thanking Maria Claudia.